Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Rakovich, and today we'll be talking about climate resilience strategies for buildings in New York State. This is the second of a two-part presentation on climate resilience strategies. Uh, so if you haven't seen the first part of this presentation, you might want to take a look at our website uh, for that first presentation to just follow along. We do want to thank uh, NYSERDA, uh, and especially Amanda Stevens at NYSERDA uh, for uh, supporting this work, uh, the research, and also supporting these webinars, and would also very much like to thank Tracy Hall at the New York Upstate Chapter of the USGBC. Finally, uh, we have a number of graduate students who have been working on this research project, and then also on preparing these webinars, so I want to thank uh, Lizzie Gilman, uh, TJ Mulligan, and also Hope Forgus, who is here this afternoon to help make sure that these webinars go smoothly. Though if anything goes wrong, it's not her fault, probably, it's probably my fault. Uh, as we mentioned in some of the earlier presentations, this is part of a larger series uh, of research that's going on at the University at Buffalo. Uh, all of that research has been published to our school's website, which has the address of ap.buffalo.edu slash adapting buildings. On that site, you'll find a lot of information about how buildings are potentially going to impact, uh, be impacted by climate change in New York State, but you'll also find a lot of different resources, one of which we're talking about today is the Climate Resilience Strategies document. So. If you're uh, going along with us today and you're interested in flipping through this, you can download this resource from the website uh, as a PDF, uh, and you can follow along each of the individual strategies as we begin to talk about them. Just to give a little bit of background for some of the folks who may uh, be joining part two without having to uh, been through part one of this presentation. So the climate resilience strategies document that we're talking about today uh, is designed as a free um, a PDF resource that can be used by different design teams uh, to integrate some of these different strategies into their work. So when we were looking at a lot of the different documents that are out on the market, each one of them actually catered to a specific audience. So it would either be owners or operators, policymakers and planners, or architects and engineers. We actually tried to design this document to appeal to all of those audiences. So if you go and you download this PDF document, you'll find that there are two page spreads uh, that talk about each one of these strategies and highlight that information. But the links that are in the document go through to peer reviewed research or to governmental documents or at the bottom lower right on the second page, as you can see on the screen, the New York uh, the New York State Climate Change Science Clearinghouse, which has a lot of great resources which can be included uh, in the design process. At the header for each of these strategies, we also have information about where the strategy may be critical within New York State based on a look uh, at historical uh, data and also trends. So in the case of building flood protection, for instance, it shows that uh, places in the southern tier in the Susquehanna River Valley and the Hudson River Valley are particularly at risk for some of the issues related to flooding. It also talks about which of the strategies, uh, which of the different hazards, excuse me, the document uh, relates to, and those have been part of the discussion that we've had uh, as part of this webinar series. Um, so it's identifying different things like flooding or rising sea levels or things like hurricanes and tropical storms. And then finally, uh, there's a series of related strategies. So if you click on any of those in the PDF document, it'll actually take you to a related strategy for that document. But the intent of this document is really to foster discussions among different team members, again, the owners and operators, the policymakers and planners, and the architects and engineers, um, to make sure that these ideas start to be incorporated into projects. So in our last presentation that we did about two weeks ago, we went through at a pretty good pace uh, about 12 of the different strategies. We're going to try to cover uh, the rest of them in the document today. In total, there are 25 documents, so this uh, 25 strategies. So this is going to be a relatively quick discussion of each one of these things, certainly not getting into the details. But the hope is, is it's enough to pique your interest and that you might want to dive into and look at these strategies in a little bit more detail uh, on your own time. <music> 
So the first strategy we're going to be talking about is neighborhood fire protection, uh, limiting the spread of a damaging hazard like wildfire uh, within New York State. When we went through some of the hazards in the past, we talked about that New York State has not had major, major wildfires in the last uh, last couple of decades. But in some cases, because of the stress being put on forests, that's not to say that this could not happen in the future, especially if we were to have a protracted drought. Uh, for fire to begin to damage buildings, you need to have a couple of conditions uh, come into play. So certainly having things like uh, living and dead trees, bushes and grasses, especially things that have been stressed, become a great fuel uh, for these types of events. When you have high temperatures and certainly low humidity or drought, it really increases the likelihood of ignition and the difficulty to control this. This is why in California, uh, for example, when they have Santa Ana winds, which are extremely uh, strong winds, but also extremely low humidity, it really produces fan, uh, the pr proper conditions for having significant wildfires. Other things that can contribute are certainly the uh, where the buildings are located relative to the urban wildland interface and things like the slope of sites, which can actually help push uh, flames as they move uphill. As the hot gases rise, they can actually uh, really ignite and, and move quickly. As we think about what we're doing uh, around buildings, as we're designing perhaps land use planning, you know, we want to think about the different zones around the buildings and how we begin to prepare them. This is from a document by Firewise Communities, and it basically outlines looking at things like the extended zone, which is up to 100 feet away from the building, about interrupting the fire path um, and keeping things uh, the major trees away from the buildings. The intermediate zone uh, is kind of the closer zone, so careful landscaping, things to uh, breaks, for example, to decrease fire behavior. And then in the immediate zone right adjacent to the house, this is probably the most important thing, you know, making sure that there aren't really any combustibles immediately away from it, and that any flammable materials and things are like mulch or plants, etc., are kept away from the house or building. When you're looking at neighborhood fire protection, it really is something where you have to bring these challenges together. Uh, you can't necessarily have something that is a fire safe community in, unless you take into account things like restoring and maintaining the landscape, really adapting the community design, but also the buildings that are existing in the communities, and also thinking about what wildfire response is, but really to make sure that you manage these conditions, all of these things that are listed on the screen need to be taken into account. And again, more detail uh, is found in these documents at some of the links that are listed at the below here, uh, but they're also found in that PDF that's available online. So jumping now, uh, talking a little bit about the next strategy, building fire protection. In this case, we're going from neighborhood fire protection down into the building scale. I think by building fire protection certainly is something that most architects and engineers are, are interested in, and think about uh, when they're designing structures. But again, as it relates to climate change, what we're in particular, uh, particularly concerned about is that wildfire risk coming from drought, coming from uh, other kinds of stress uh, on our forest systems. So making sure uh, when those conditions are right that the conditions are being monitored, uh, that we know uh, of any alerts. Uh, certainly in California, we saw that some of these uh, wildfires can actually pop up quite quickly and move quite quickly in situations. When the wildfire does happen, making sure that all of the information, the five Ps, people, prescriptions, papers, personal needs and anything that are priceless are moved uh, or prepared to be moved quite quickly to get out of the space. And then after a wildfire, uh, as you come back, you know, making sure that you use caution when you enter some of these areas, because certainly um, things like debris or other things may cause problems or uh, injure people who are trying to find or return to their properties. Um, really getting into and thinking about building level uh, wildfire protection requires uh, a lot of different steps. Certainly everyone needs to prepare for their own homes. Also, uh, fire departments spend a lot of time emphasizing fire safety within school districts and at schools. But also, uh, the community and architects and engineers can get involved, certainly in volunteering uh, for disaster relief efforts. I know that right now, the AIA, for instance, in New York State is promoting what's called CEDAR training uh, to help 
um, code officials and also architects and engineers be prepared to help uh, respond in these types of events and determine whether or not buildings are safe uh, to be response, uh, responded to. And then other things like donating, um, thinking about installing fire alarms as a donation in lower income or at risk communities. Oftentimes loss of property uh, could be avoided or loss of life could be afforded just by making sure that every building has some kind of notification uh, in the event a fire happens. In terms of the design of buildings, uh, the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, has a lot of uh, great guides in terms of providing uh, actually details on how to design buildings to avoid wildfire risk. In this case, uh, one of the examples that they show is just thinking about designing buildings with no overhangs to reduce the opportunity for embers or hot gases to actually be trapped. The hot gases as they come up from a fire can actually build underneath a deep overhang uh, and cause that to actually ignite. Or certainly if you have uh, deep overhangs, it's also a place where embers can actually fall uh, and get trapped in gutters uh, and other kinds of conditions. This is just one example of the many, many that they have in their different documentation. And I encourage you to take a look at the Home Builder's Guide to Construction and Wildfire Zones because it really um, has a lot of those critical details that can be helpful. Moving on to the next strategy, insulation. Probably one of the most critical things in New York State, not only for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of uh, thinking about how we might respond to certain hazards like heat waves on the hot end of the spectrum or winter storms on the cold end of the spectrum. Why insulation ends up being really important in these conditions is certainly about protecting the occupants from extreme uh, temperature swings or in the event of a power outage associated with either uh, grid failure, let's say during the summertime or power outages in the wintertime, right? Keeping that heat in the house or keeping the cool in the house uh, really becomes a critical strategy. And since um, more people die of heat waves than really any other type of natural disaster, insulation really, really uh, does become an important thing to think about as a climate resilience tool. I think it, nobody is surprised who lives or works in the Northeast that insulation has a lot of great benefits in terms of certainly reducing uh, air, condition, air conditioning usage or uh, things like space heating uh, within the building um, and, and driving some of those costs down. But as we get into and again start talking about things like heat waves, you know, people who are under the age of four or over 65 are at great risk during heat wave event. A lot of people who do end up uh, having medical uh, issues during heat waves, a lot of them are isolated within buildings. And a lot of people across New York State actually don't have access to air conditioning. So where we live uh, in Buffalo, New York, for example, it's estimated that only about 50% of the people who live here have air conditioning. And certainly those below the poverty line may actually have air conditioning, but not enough money to actually run it or afford it. Other things that come up uh, when people have window air conditioning units, right, are that uh, people are concerned about people breaking into their homes and taking those window air conditioning units out. And so thinking about strategies, passive environmental strategies that can keep a building cool, perhaps without using the air conditioning or out using heating, like insulation, become really important for that. So um, just a uh, uh, chat question pop up here. So a question uh, from uh, one of the attendees. So out of curiosity, if the insulation is an effective strategy, uh, why would a place like New York City be indicated as a low risk? Uh, really, that's looking, um, so that's a great question in terms of the maps we presented a couple minutes ago. Um, it's, it's not so much that New York City in itself is a low risk, it's that compared to some of the places in the northern part of the state, which are seeing uh, heat waves happening more frequently, um, there's a little bit more concern in there. But in, certainly in all cases, we're concerned and want to make sure that we get insulation uh, into buildings to help reduce heat waves. I do want to point out, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, uh, if you can hold questions to the end, I'll, I'll, I'll try to address those at about 12.50, um, just so we can make sure we get through all of these different strategies. But uh, thanks for that question. So uh, in terms of talking about insulation, uh, one of the ways we've done insulation in the past is certainly to think about um, 
putting insulation, let's say, between wood studs and, and walls. Uh, one of the newer techniques that's starting to be used across New York State are things like structural insulated panels. Uh, these do have an added benefit of uh, really having a much higher level of insulation within the walls, but also less thermal bridging coming from uh, the studs themselves. And so uh, one of the other things that I can start to do is reduce the total infiltration that comes into the house, which also contributes certainly to higher temperatures during heat waves or colder temperatures during uh, cold snaps. So it's a potential technology to, to begin to think about uh, in terms of the design and construction of, of uh, wood frame buildings. So moving into the next strategy, neighborhood development. Uh, certainly as a planner, this is one of the areas where I'm extremely interested um, and, and do a lot of work with local communities in the state. Um, you know, to the comment earlier about why would New York City be listed as a high risk or low risk, really this is all a qualitative assessment just based on the past data. So as you look, uh, for instance, at the map in New York State, it's not to say that, um, that, you know, you should not think about neighborhood development in the southern tier or the northern parts of the state, but perhaps relative to some of the other locations, in this case, some of the more industrialized or uh, urban environments, there may be a little bit higher of a risk. As we jump into and think about uh, whole community principles, we wanna make sure that we go through and understand and meet the real needs of the whole community. So as you start to do uh, planning work and start to work with communities, you'll find that every community or even every neighborhood has a lot of unique and diverse needs and that it takes some time to build trust and to get to know the community well to understand its needs and motivations. This is really not something that can be done through just one meeting. It's really about being there multiple times and having conversations and building trust among all the stakeholders. As it relates to climate resilience, we wanna make sure that we engage and empower all parts of the community. Um, a lot of the strategies we talk about in this document are about building related uh, systems, but really making sure that there's strong social cohesion among all of the people in the neighborhood can actually help to overcome some of these events as well. And so getting them engaged in the process, you know, making sure that people are checking on each other can help to handle these hazards or threats really trying to get all of the community members to be part of the emergency management when something happens is, is pretty important. One of the other things that you want to talk about um, is what assets do you have that you can begin to build from. So a lot of times as we think about climate resilience, we talk about the vulnerabilities of a community or the vulnerabilities of a building, but taking an asset based approach where you think about strengthening the exist of positive community attributes, what good things do you have in the community, what institutions are there, or what networks can help push this forward becomes really uh, critical. And so as you think about uh, the whole community and some of those strategic themes, again, you know, understanding the community, recognizing some of those community capabilities and needs, building relationships, maintaining those partnerships over time that, so that you're empowering local action. Really, all of these things can come together as in a, a whole community approach to emergency management. And FEMA has a lot more information at the document that's listed at the bottom of the page, but just wanted to point these things out um, as a way to introduce this idea. As we go through, when we look uh, at neighborhood plans, they really must include policies that guarantee improvement and attention to both climate change mitigation and adaptation. So when we say mitigation and adaptation, what we mean is mitigating some of the threats, but also mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to those expected changes. And so we're looking to develop low carbon neighborhoods. And so one of the key things, uh, for instance, that New York State does to support this is through DEC and Climate Smart Communities. A lot of uh, cities within New York State have signed up and taken the Climate Smart Communities pledge, and it really starts to push and, and have some of these ideas about improving health, empowering the community, benefiting the local economy, improving the quality of life, resilience, climate change, et cetera. All of these things are really positive attributes that we really want to see, I think, as community members, but also as designers. And so coming in uh, and, and thinking about how these things integrate really can be a positive thing to build the resilience of a community. Why this becomes important is in terms of 
the functionality of a, a space or how quickly it recovers. You know, you might have a community that bounces back much more quickly. So if you have a, a hazard event, if you've designed to that and you've thought about community community re related resilience, you might bounce back much more quickly from that type of event uh, and certainly have less in terms of the losses. Not taking these things to an account, and it is a tricky condition or a tricky issue. You know, a lot of people want to know how vulnerable they are or how much damage would be caused by event. In many cases, that can be difficult to predict, but putting some of these adaptations into place, at least in theory, will help you uh, in the long run or in the case of one of these um, hazards. Moving into the next strategy, talking a little bit about urban heat island. Uh, this is something that I'm personally very interested in, certainly can talk about uh, in great detail, um, and unfortunately only have about four slides and four minutes to cover this as a topic. Uh, but the urban heat island is certainly an issue in urbanized locations within New York State. Uh, as we look at things like heat waves, um, that certainly is one of the critical issues that we're thinking about. But there is some evidence that urban heat island may actually help to fuel some of the severe storms. And also in having uh, warmer conditions in urban environments may allow for more types of pest infestation, not just insects, but other types of things like uh, bacteria, which we'll talk about here in a second. The urban heat island is basically the difference between uh, the temperatures in the urban core versus the rural surroundings. So the EPA has a lot of different great information about reducing the urban heat island effect. And it shows this document, which um, you know shows how temperatures, surf, both surface temperatures and air temperatures can be much higher within the core of a city than they are in the surroundings. One of the other issues that becomes important is also at night, the urban heat island can actually trap uh, some of that additional heat into uh, the urban centers and keep places warmer. So when we talk about um, things like heat-related morbidity and mortality, when you have those high temperatures at night, it certainly can contribute to uh, additional, um, additional illness or, and or death. When we look at different things like uh, how we can begin to um, reduce the urban heat island effect, bringing things like green infrastructure into a city not only helps from reducing surface temperatures, but also because uh, plants, especially woody trees, uh, woody shrubs and trees, actually pull water from the soil and evapotranspirate it into the atmosphere. That can take a significant amount of the heat with it. Um, so in addition to providing shade, that evapotranspiration really reduces the lower air temperatures. It also can help with issues like stormwater runoff, which we talked about uh, in the last webinar. Um, so green infrastructure really can have multiple functions uh, that really benefit the urban environment. As we get into the building design and looking at uh, what types of roof coatings we begin to use on buildings and also on pavement, uh, certainly the white roofs have really taken off uh, within the architectural and engineering community, and they can do things like reduce the overall air conditioning loads on buildings in the summertime, but it actually also contributes to reducing the urban heat island effect. And as we look at also the pavements that we bring in, in addition to wanting to provide shading for those pavements, thinking about what those materials are. So you either using light colored concretes or in some cases now in California, they're actually spraying white coatings on streets to begin to reflect some of the heat back. Um, this can all help with reducing the urban heat island effect uh, in our climate zone in New York State. Next strategy, talking a little bit and along the lines uh, of the urban heat island effect about building ventilation. So this is really diving into uh, really a time-honored technique uh, and thinking about passive strategies for adapting to higher temperature events. Again, this is something that really, you know, thinking about proper ventilation is something that you want to have across all of New York State, and this can help with things like heat waves, but it can also help uh, with things like flooding in terms of airing uh, buildings out or making sure um, that afterwards that uh, those materials can be ventilated out of space. This is a diagram uh, adapted for the National Center for Healthy Housing. Uh, if you do any kind of uh, weatherization work, you'll know that this is a diagram that's shown really frequently uh, in terms of understanding where uh, air gets into a home in terms of infiltration, uh, but also where we are trying to actually um, 
keep, uh, sorry, I'm not saying this very clearly, but you know, we have air that actually infiltrates into the building, but you also have air that exfiltrates out of the building, which can lead, uh, lead to a, a leaky house environment. In our cool to cold climate of New York State, controlling infiltration becomes really important, um, not only from an energy standpoint, but also because we want to make sure that uh, we have proper ventilation for the people in the building to prevent mold and mildew growth. So as we start to tighten up buildings to control infiltration, we need to make sure that we have balanced ventilation systems that are going to um, protect the health of the occupants. As we look at some of the different ways that we think about whole house ventilation in buildings, uh, certainly if we're thinking about mechanical ventilation in the building, uh, there are a couple of different approaches. Uh, one that is probably the simplest installation is just exhaust um, exhaust ventilation systems, which just exhaust air out and allow air to come through um, into the into the building through openings, uh, hopefully controlled openings. One of the problems with an exhaust ventilation system is that if, as you negatively pressurize the building, you can begin to pull radon uh, pollutants like radon into the building, which is just a, a degradation of uranium actually in the soil, but it is radioactive and we do have problems with it in many parts of New York State. It also is something certainly that can raise heating and cooling costs or cause things like backdrafts on uh, different combustion environments. Other types of approaches uh, probably that are more preferable are things like supply ventilation systems that actually rather than depressurizing the building, think about pressurizing the building. It certainly has less chance of backdrafting on, in the similar simple installation. Um, however, you can start to have problems with moisture problems in buildings, uh, and it really is relying in some cases on the air leaks to actually drive that out and also can drive up heating and cooling costs. Really where we want to think about going is having ba balanced ventilation systems, uh, and you're starting to see these a lot more in passive houses or buildings that have tighter uh, envelopes where you're trying to match exactly how much air is you're bringing in with how much air is going out, and oftentimes taking that uh, fresh air through an energy or heat recovery ventilator. This is something that can work really in all of the climate zones of New York State. Some of the cons of this, though, are higher installation costs uh, and possible increase of heating and cooling costs because really you do have to start to run a fan at all times uh, to make sure that these systems operate. Uh, one of my personal favorite strategies as an architect and something that I, I think we don't talk enough about in building design is when we don't need um, heating or cooling, when we have those kind of temperate days, which we see a lot of in the fall or a lot of in the spring, designing the building to be adequately cross-ventilated or to have things like stack ventilation. So cross-ventilation is really, uh, as we think about design considerations for it, you know, the amount of ventilation we have is dependent on the uh, placement and design of the internal spaces, but also the design of the openings. We have to look and see uh, how the building uh, is designed relative to being perpendicular to summer winds. It also changes overall the, the overall form of the buildings, uh, and we need to make sure that those windows are actually uh, operable for the uh, the occupants inside the building. But really, you know, cross ventilation is probably as old as buildings themselves. You know, making sure that you have the leeward and windward sides of the building and those openings matched up uh, really can go a long way to to having uh, a good system. Stack ventilation is something that actually relies on the natural buoyancy of warm air to carry it out of the space. So uh, hopefully it comes as no surprise to folks that hot air does actually rise. And so as that hot air pulls up, it actually can pull in cooler air from the outside. If you think about the traditional New York farmhouse scheme, which has kind of a center hall and a tall uh, set of windows at the top of that space, you know, really that was intended on the days when there wasn't enough wind to cross ventilate the space to carry that hot air uh, up and out of the space. And so that airflow is really based on uh, difference in air density, but you can imagine ways to design buildings um, where you actually incorporate both of those strategies. So on a windy day or on a still day, you actually still have uh, pretty high performance. One thing about uh, cross and stack ventilation, though, is it really does not help you control humidity. Um, and so if you're looking for tight humidity control, you may have to think about hybridized systems that uh, can work on those days when it's a little less humid. 
It goes along uh, and ties to the next strategy, which is talking about indoor air quality. Again, indoor air quality is something that's critical in all parts of the state, uh, and it can help with things like heat waves, flooding, and also uh, certainly some of the different types of pest infestations. And we're going to talk a little bit about mold and bacteria here uh, in particular. Uh, what this diagram is trying to show, you know, is that indoor and indoor environments, we certainly can have a lot of different things that are causing indoor air quality problems. I don't want you to take away from the diagram that climate change is going to cause giant bacteria to form or giant, giant uh, cockroaches to come into spaces. But the different types of indoor emissions that we have in spaces, you know, uh, we really can compound those outdoor emissions, and we often find that indoor levels of contaminants are 10 times uh, what they are on the outside uh, in the outdoor environment. The outdoor pollutants are also something that can come into spaces, so certainly in urban environments, uh, things like vehicle exhaust or other things um, like local conditions, other manufacturing that might be around it can certainly uh, contribute to indoor air quality issues. As we went through and developed this document, one of the things that we really referred to and looked at in great detail was a document from the National Institute of Medicine called Climate Change, the Indoor Environment and Health. You know, if you're interested in this as an issue, if you're an indoor air quality guru or practitioner and are interested in getting into more detail about how climate change might impact buildings, this is an entire free book that you can download from that link below and goes into an, in much, much more detail than what we can talk about today. One of the critical things uh, for indoor air quality and certainly for the prevention of mold or mildew growth in buildings is really thinking about how we keep water out of buildings. If you don't have uh, excessive moisture or you don't have humidity problems in the buildings because you've controlled it, you certainly are keeping those mold issues from ever occurring. And so thinking about the design of the envelope in terms of its drainage planes and making sure that any moisture is really being carried away from any of the occupiable spaces and really good practice making sure that you have multiple redundant drainage planes to keep the water out of the space becomes important. The EPA has a lot of guidance on this, so most uh, their moisture control guidance for building design, construction, and maintenance, but also a number of other organizations like ASHRAE have provided additional details uh, that can help with guidance and, and thinking about how you design these um, types of systems. Other places where you can look to information, so the Environmental Protection Agency, if you're working in schools, uh, they have an entire tools for schools program, also an Indoor Air Plus program, and they did have a couple of uh, years ago a cooperative agreement program, which provided some funding to local governments, institutions, and nonprofits. I believe this is something that's actually being talked about right now at the EPA about being refunded, and so that may be something that we see uh, here in in the next couple of weeks uh, coming back online. Other things like the National Institutes of Health, uh, they really created that document, again, that's listed at the bottom. They have uh, different programs that they're administering funds for, for doing research to understand how in indoor air quality affects health. Um, but they've also partnered with the EPA on things, especially related to children, or HUD, Housing and Urban Development Office of Lead Hazard Control, to administer and understand not only lead-based hazards in buildings, but also allergens. And so again, the allergens, things like pollen, um, uh, certainly are, can be concentrated inside. The CDC also has a National Center for Environmental Health, and they also provide research related to these topics. So. Potentially, if you're looking for research funding or you're looking for resources to help you with the design project, uh, these are three just of many that are listed in the book I mentioned uh, that can provide you with more information uh, on this topic. Jumping into the next strategy, passive building systems. Passive building systems are really those uh, building systems that require no energy to operate. So as you think about the things that are tried and true in architectural design, like daylighting, like natural ventilation, uh, like good envelope design, that's really something that can begin to reduce the total loads up front before you even begin to consider the active building systems. Again, this is something that is important really all everywhere across New York State. Um, but certainly in some of our more extreme environments of the state, we want to uh, have a, a special detail, a special attention to it. 
Although we have a couple of hazards listed here, like heat waves, winter storms, and hurricanes, uh, it's really something that can tie uh, really to all of those different systems. Because certainly, if we have power outages, we want to think about the issue of passive survivability, which is how these buildings actually can operate uh, without any energy um, being supplied to building systems. You know, how is the building daylit? Uh, if you don't have uh, electric lighting available or how is the building stay cool? Certainly if you have a power outage and you don't have air conditioning available. Passive environmental system design or passive system design really goes back to the, the basics of design. So thinking about how buildings are oriented on the site, thinking about uh, the sun being higher in the summer and lower in the winter uh, can drive a lot of the ways that our buildings perform seasonally, um, but also how they begin to adapt to the diurnal or day-to-day -day swings uh, in temperature uh, and sunlight coming into the space. In our climate zones of New York State, you know, we're typically thinking about a building that is longer on the east-west axis so that the long face of the building is facing south or thinking about a building that actually has a closed fo uh, close form like a square to really reduce the amount of heat loss that we might see in the wintertime. But these things and getting these design decisions right up front uh, really do help uh, begin to reduce overall loads. As we look at some of the buildings, uh, you know, beyond the scale of a house and we start to think about some of the larger commercial buildings that have been built, you know, this is something that really before electric lighting took off, you know, we certainly thought about how we brought daylight into buildings. And before air conditioning really took off, we also thought about how these buildings could be naturally ventilated. So it isn't something that's limited to just a house in scale. You know, as you look at the Larkin building, which was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1906, had a center, uh, our uh, center uh, atrium space that allowed for stack ventilation, that allowed for natural ventilation to go through into the space. It's widely considered to be one of the first modern office buildings. But also in a place like New York City, when you get into tall buildings, the Woolworth building by, uh, by Cass Gilbert in 1912, you know, each one of those offices had access to uh, the outside and you could begin to cross ventilate across the corridor, you know, to make sure that those buildings stayed cool. This is something that, you know, we really are starting to see coming back into a larger building design, and hopefully we'll see more hybrid buildings like this um, in the future. As we start to think then about how the different systems begin to perform, it's important to designate uh, a little bit of a difference between passive systems and something like passive house. So passive house is actually an approach um, and a designation by the Passive House Institute. And so in the passive houses, which are really trying to be designed, uh, systems trying to be designed so that you don't require heating or cooling uh, really year round, they're really focusing on high levels of thermal, uh, thermal insulation, triple glazed windows, making sure that the building is extremely airtight, and also that the, the building envelope is free of thermal bridging. And last but not least, that there are things like heat recovery ventilators to reuse any of that heat uh, from the space. Passive house and passive design are really all on a continuum, but passive houses really are at the deep, deep end in, in terms of really trying to push uh, on all of these issues. And there's a, some interesting uh, additional evidence to say that, you know, passive houses, in addition to saving a tremendous amount of energy, might be something that protect people during things like heat waves, although uh, I think that research is still kind of uh, ongoing. Jumping into the next strategy, active building systems. So different from uh, passive building systems, active building systems are those systems that actually do require energy to operate, to provide heating, provide cooling. So when you think about traditional air conditioning systems or traditional heating systems like a furnace, right, they require external inputs of energy to make sure that they operate. As we look at buildings and we think about the different active things that they draw upon to operate, there are a lot of different types of systems that we need to have all function to make sure that the building operates. So um, a lot of times buildings are considered to be end users of energy or end users of things like communications. But really in the, this day and age, uh, we're starting to see buildings actually supply power to the grid or be places that are uh, hubs for communication systems. But as you think about uh, if you have employees or you have 
uh, children in school, you'll know that if you lose any one of these systems, if you no longer have electric power, if you no longer have communications or water, any loss of any single one of those systems can be enough to actually shut the building down. So in this interconnected environment of all of these different types of sectors and all of these things coming into our building as a hub, we need to make sure that we're planning for either redundancy in cases of mission critical facilities or that we're thinking about ways that these buildings can operate um, without some of those those different services and this goes back to the idea of passive survivability in that case it's about electrical systems you know but water and other types of systems become really critical in terms of that discussion and other things certainly too if you don't have transportation to work because you've had a snow event uh, like in a place like buffalo um, you know certainly that can be something that shuts down an environment other types of systems or approaches that people are beginning to think about as backups, ways to back things up, are things like solar hot water uh, systems. Some of the simpler systems like batch systems actually can use no energy to operate. And as long as you still have water pressure uh, in a space, uh, you certainly can also have hot water uh, for things. For extended power outages, these passive solar systems uh, end up being pretty important. And certainly in places where people might be sheltering in place for several days, uh, making sure that they have uh, access to sanitation like that becomes pretty important. Uh, other things, so this is a diagram of Buffalo, New York. That is Buffalo, New York's flag. Uh, this is kind of a typical Tuesday in November, December in Buffalo, New York. But thinking about uh, all of the different systems that go into buildings in the event, not only for power outages because of the summer, but also the winter, you know, it really is calling for us to design structures that allowed for people to live within them without power, fuel, or water for an extended period of time. This can be something as extreme as Hurricane Sandy or something like uh, this November event that we saw in 2014, or something as short as uh, this, past fall, uh, this past winter we actually had uh, hurricane force winds in Buffalo for one day where a lot of people had power outages from anywhere from 12 to, you know, two days. And um, certainly thinking about how you maintain the temperatures in the wintertime when those powers are out through insulation or other things uh, become really important. And at the bottom is a great document called The Impact of Increasing Severe Weather Events on Shelter. And it begins to give some additional guidance uh, on how you look at some of these issues within a structure. Next strategy in terms of building operation. So just making sure, um, you know, you, you can't manage a building unless you begin to collect data and have the data to understand how things are operating. This can be certainly pulling things and data from things like uh, building management systems, but also going through and doing site surveys or interviews to understand how the building is operating can be an important thing that goes not only into the operation of the building, but also how the building is maintained over time. Um, the construction management, uh, project management from that and making sure that you're scheduling these things out and being proactive goes a long way in terms of thinking about uh, getting ahead of problems before they become problems for the building occupants. And so developing the documents. And again, this is probably something that's easier for large uh, organizations to do or places that manage large number of buildings, but down to something as simple as providing building manuals for building owners or for homeowners can help them uh, with some of these processes. So keeping something sustainable, you know, the idea that you're meeting the needs not only of the present, but future uh, operations, you know, really does require operations and maintenance taking into consideration health, safety, and comfort. Um, productivity and also the actions of the occupants. It's not just about how the building systems are operating, the building management system, you know, understanding that these buildings are being uh, supporting the people who live in them are pretty important. So that can take into account things like training occupants and staff about how the building works, um, but also getting into things like computerized maintenance systems, which can schedule and record things in the future, um, beginning to think about, again, proactive management, not waiting till things become a problem, uh, becomes really important to get ahead of some of these climate-related issues. <laughs>
One thing that we want to call out in particular is in facilities that have safe rooms that are uh, designed to actually weather out storms. Uh, there are some really critical um, things that need to be done in terms of the management of these specific facilities. FEMA has a document from 2015 about safe rooms for tornadoes and hurricanes, but they really uh, recommend that um, these community spaces are designed um, to have an, an and to serve as the intended occupant group. So you've seen in examples, for for example, like uh, when Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans, you know, the specific design of the, the Superdome was not something that was to support being a shelter in place. And so they had uh, a lot of issues related to that. But also thinking about what types of hazards you're gonna see, that there are emergency provisions and safety supplies, um, that you're able to control movement both in and out of the space during some of these hazards that you're able to keep uh, an account of who is actually in the building, but also what has happened after the event. But these buildings also, and these types of spaces require uh, additional maintenance and make sure that it's ready for all of those emergencies. So making sure that the inventory um, for the emergency supplies or safety supplies are always updated and inventoried um, and scheduled for things to replace. So things like water, for example, that are kept in space, it doesn't last uh, an infinite amount of time. Uh, things like that sometimes can have expiration dates. So making sure that you're cycling through those things uh, as you're designing and also operating these buildings becomes really important. Potable water systems. Uh, Architects and engineers are all really con uh, have been concerned recently with conserving water in New York State and concerning uh, conserving water in green buildings in general. Uh, certainly, there have been a lot of different strategies that have come online in terms of high efficiency fixtures, uh, things like eliminating leaks to reduce uh, total water usage in buildings. Uh, and I think everybody's probably pretty familiar with some of the ways as a homeowner you can also uh, begin to save water in structures. There are uh, other things that are starting to be permitted uh, by different health departments in terms of starting to use water, uh, for example, rainwater for uh, in cisterns or into rain barrels uh, to begin to use them for functions where you don't need potable water. So watering plants oftentimes outside, you really don't need uh, water that's been treated by a municipality to do that. So using that to actually reduce your total potable water uh, consumption becomes pretty important. And as we talked about uh, with the last uh, webinar that we did about things like green infrastructure, these certainly can also tie into some of those systems to reduce stormwater runoff. As we dive into the buildings themselves, one of the really key issues that we have to think about in places like New York City that use water towers uh, for potable water, not only uh, thinking about how we want to conserve water, but also uh, how those water systems are maintained. So in a lot of those water towers in New York City, with rising temperatures, there's concern about Legionella growth or uh, poor maintenance of those facilities, uh, letting things like um, other types of pests actually get into the space and follow the water. With warmer temperatures, you have increased bacterial growth. Uh, and then in addition to potentially making someone sick in the building from drinking the water directly or inhaling it through something like a shower, you can actually have Legionella or other kinds of problems spread through the air as that water evaporates. And so um, for folks, especially with weakened immune systems, we want to think about how we're protecting those systems and thinking about the potable water source, not only you know, from where it comes from, let's say this uh, municipal source, but all the way through uh, into the building design itself. So ASHRAE has some guidance about this, uh, but also the CDC uh, uh, also has some information about Legionella. Uh, and this is talked about extensively in the indoor air uh, book uh, by the National Institutes of Medicine. Reclaimed water systems. So again, thinking about systems that actually use uh, reuse water as much as possible when you don't need potable water for uh, things like wastewater, you know, to flush your toilet or things like actually uh, watering plants or something like that outside. There are opportunities to reduce the total throughput uh, in those municipal systems. Uh, California has some great examples of things that they did and permitted during uh, the drought that happened a couple of years ago. So these are from the city and county of San Francisco. Different ways to actually allow uh, water, for instance, coming off of laundry systems to be used uh, to 
to water landscape, or some of my favorite ex examples and were adapted from Japan are actually sinks that are on the back of uh, toilets and allow you to wash your hands. And then that gray water from you washing your hands is then used to flush the toilet. A very simple kind of retrofit that, ca that can go into uh, a building and save a fair amount of water. EPA has a lot of guidance on water reuse. Uh, it certainly can be a tricky issue uh, because not all water that's used in buildings can be reclaimed for other purposes. So making sure that you look to some of these types of documents, but also consult with local health officials become important um, because gray water can have certain types of contamination in it that may not uh, be something you want to have people come into contact with. Integrated pest management. So certainly an issue uh, on the rise as we see new types of pests uh, species moving into New York State, potentially doing damage to things like wood frame buildings, but also uh, things making people sick within a structure uh, as new insects or other types of pests move northward. Having a pest problem really requires a uh, problem of the source, you know, actually having the pest itself, a pathway for those pests to get into the structure, and then oftentimes uh, then the integration or uh, interaction with an occupant within a building. If you can eliminate any one of those three things, except perhaps the occupant, the source of the pests, or the pathway for them to get in the structure, oftentimes you can make the problem go away entirely. And so thinking about ways that you perhaps get rid of food sources, which draw the insects in, or you control pathways, uh, conduit in buildings, for instance, oftentimes acts as like a super highway for insect pests to move between spaces, to really can save uh, and, and see a lot of positive things like reducing pesticide use or things like asthma triggers and sick days. Uh, important thing to point out here is that pesticides, you know, when we see perhaps increased pests in New York State, we don't want to increase the pesticide usage, but that's really not something that can be used on athletic fields, playgrounds, or playing fields that are on the grounds of schools or daycare centers. So integrated pest management in some of these facilities, you know, is really the only approach that we want to take. And certainly as we want to think about children's health, um, we we want to think about integrated pest management as an approach um, for some of these things we may begin to see in the future. Again, this diagram is not intended to show that termites are going to become giant because of climate change, but certainly we are seeing termite uh, infestations beginning to move northward. Some of the folks we talked to in central New York are beginning to include some of these termite control prevention measures uh, in the buildings that they're designing because as we start to see warmer winters, it perhaps doesn't kill off as many of the termites, uh, and certainly in those wood frame buildings, they can be quite devastating. So keeping the pests out of the building uh, having baits that actually keep uh, the pests from getting into the buildings and then thinking about things like stainless steel mesh around the foundations can do a lot to keep the termites away from the, the wood structure themselves. So we just blew through about 12 different strategies here in uh, 55 minutes. Um, we're going to open it up here for questions in a second, but again, we do want to thank NYSERDA uh, for support for this work and also the USGBC uh, New York State Upstate Chapter. Uh, Tracy Hall and Amanda Stevens have really done a lot to, to make these webinars uh, and this whole project successful. Also want to thank the graduate students, uh, Lizzie Gilman, Hope Forgus, and TJ Mulligan uh, for helping to prepare this presentation. Uh, again, if you're interested in this topic, we would ask you to please go to the ap.buffalo.edu slash adapting buildings, uh, where you can find a copy of this report. And hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have all of the webinars that we've done uh, posted to that site as well, as long as uh, as well as PDF uh, copies of the PowerPoint presentation for your use. And that's really it. I'll just leave this slide on the screen and I think we'll open it up here. Uh, for questions. If you want to ask questions, uh, we would ask perhaps that you use the chat feature um, that's found in WebEx because in the past we've had some issues with um, background noise uh, when people do that. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat feature and we'd be happy to, to answer it for you. I guess if there are no questions, uh, we would just encourage you to take a look at this website. Um, certainly the Resilience Strategies document provides a lot more information ap.buffalo.edu slash adapting buildings 
Um, again, you can find the report there. But if you do have any questions or maybe you're a bit shy and just want to uh, send me an email, my contact information is available at ap.buffalo.edu and my last name, Rakovich. So uh, if you want to reach out to give me a phone call or to send me an email, you can find my information there. Uh, thank you, though, very much for participating today. We'll uh, wrap up this webinar. If you have time on Thursday at noon, we would encourage you to join us. Uh, we'll be talking about the last issue of uh, energy modeling in buildings in New York State um, and, and hope to be able to share that information with you. So thanks very much.